Novel. Goodbye, Mr. Chips by James Hilton. And the chapter is four. So, let's start. There came to, to him, stirred by the warmth of the fire and the gentle aroma of tea, a thousand tangled recollections of old times. Spring, the spring of 1896. He was 48 an age at which a permanence of habits begins to be predictable. He had just been appointed housemaster, with this and his classical forms, he had made for himself a warm and busy corner of life. During the summer vacation he went up to the Lake District with Roden, a colleague, they walked and climbed for a week, until Roden had to leave suddenly on some family business. Chip stayed on alone at Wasdale Head, where he boarded in a small farmhouse. One day, climbing on Great Gable, he noticed a girl waving excitedly from a dangerous-looking ledge. Thinking she was in difficulties, he hastened toward her, but in doing so slipped himself and wrenched his ankle. As it turned out, she was not in difficulties at all, but was merely signaling to a friend farther down the mountain, she was an expert climber, better even than Chips, who was pretty good. Thus he found himself the rescued instead of the rescuer, and neither role was one for which he had much relish. For he did not, he would have said, care for women, he never felt at home or at ease with them, and that monstrous creature beginning to be talked about, the new woman of the nineties, filled him with horror. He was a quiet, conventional person, and the world, viewed from the haven of Brookfield, seemed to him full of distasteful innovations, there was a fellow named Bernard Shaw who had the strangest and most reprehensible opinions, there was Ibsen, too, with his disturbing plays, and there was this new craze for bicycling, bicycling which was being taken up by women equally with men. Chips did not hold with all this modern newness and freedom. He had a vague notion, if he ever formulated it, that nice women were weak, timid, and delicate, and that nice men treated them with a polite but rather distant chivalry. He had not, therefore, expected to find a woman on Great Gable, but, having encountered one who seemed to need masculine help, it was even more terrifying that she should turn the tables by helping him. For she did. She and her friend had to. He could scarcely walk, and it was a hard job getting him down the steep track to his dale. Her name was Catherine Bridges, she was twenty-five, young enough to be Chip's daughter. She had blue, flashing eyes and freckled cheeks and smooth straw-colored hair. She too was staying at a farm on holiday with a girlfriend, and as she considered herself responsible for Chip's accident, she used to bicycle along the side of the lake to the house in which the quiet, middle-aged, serious-looking man lay resting. That was how she thought of him at first. And he, because she rode a bicycle and was unafraid to visit a man alone in a farmhouse sitting room, wondered vaguely what the world was coming to. His sprain put him at her mercy, and it was soon revealed to him how much he might need that mercy. She was a governess out of a job, with a little money saved up, she read and admired Ibsen, she believed that women ought to be admitted to the universities, she even thought they ought to have a vote. In politics she was a radical, radical, with leanings toward the views of people like Bernard Shaw and William Morris. All her ideas and opinions she poured out to Chips during those summer afternoons at was Dale Head, and he, because he was not very articulate, did not at first think it worthwhile to contradict them. Her friend went away, but she stayed, what could you do with such a person, Chips thought. He used to hobble with sticks along a footpath leading to the tiny church, there was a stone slab on the wall, and it was comfortable to sit down, facing the sunlight and the green-brown majesty of the gable and listening to the chatter of, well, yes, Chips had to admit it, a very beautiful girl. He had never met anyone like her. He had always thought that the modern type, this new woman business, would repel him, and here she was, making him positively look forward to the glimpse of her safety bicycle careering along the lakeside road. And she, too, had never met anyone like him. 
She had always thought that middle-aged men who read the times and disapproved of modernity were terrible bores, yet here he was, claiming her interest and attention far more than youths of her own age. She liked him, initially, because he was so hard to get to know, because he had gentle and quiet manners, because his opinions dated from those utterly impossible 70s and 80s and even earlier, yet were, for all that, so thoroughly honest, and because, because his eyes were brown and he looked charming when he smiled. Of course, underscore I underscore shall call you Chips, too, she said, when she learned that was his nickname at school. Within a week, they were head over heels in love, before Chips could walk without a stick, they considered themselves engaged, and they were married in London a week before the beginning of the autumn term. Hey guys, this the fourth chapter of the novel, Goodbye Mr. Chips. For more chapters, like, share, and subscribe our YouTube channel, Seekin 2.0. Share your opinion in the comments section and see you soon, bye, Allah. Hafiz.